All right, cool. I should let me hide this bar right here. Okay, I think you guys should be able to see it. Cool. Um, awesome. Well, uh, so our module this week uh, was, um, uh, we, we're jumping ahead. The events in the world just seemed appropriate. Uh, and the last week it was what was all over the news and a lot of people were obsessing. So I thought we would uh, do a little pivot and move something that we were planning on talking about later in the semester um, to this point in the semester. So um, I have for you guys the, uh, my sort of general introduction to nuclear uh, uh, energy and releases. Um, so if you haven't that yet, um, but what we're going to talk about here is we'll touch on a couple of those things by way of review, but really talk more about um, uh, what's been going on and what that might mean for um, uh, future types of disasters like this. Now, recall when we talk about disasters, um, using those uh, uh, different uh, frames that we started with at the beginning of the beginning of the semester. Um, we ex specifically excluded war, right? So we said, you know, that that's not, even though a lot of times the knock-on effects from war are, you know, identical to natural disasters in the sense of maybe a war starts a wildfire and the wildfire burns through. Um, for for various reasons, uh, the UN, our various tracking organizations, our, our, our groups working on conceptualizing what disasters are, oftentimes, Disaggregate conflict, active conflict, war uh, from other disasters. Um, so this is an interesting case where um, uh, uh, it, it, it gets muddled. It gets muddled, unfortunately. So I wanted to talk about uh, that today. So um, obviously, in the context of the the ongoing war, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, and so uh, as a, if you guys. If it doesn't make sense, or or if uh, you guys have had your head buried in classes and stuff and haven't been following the news by reference, something that doesn't make sense, uh, please do raise your raise your hand and we can talk about. It. Let me dim the light in the room. Can you just that? And do this. Okay. So radiological releases, right? So these are, uh, these have been a part of our world for some time. And uh, they seem to be a phenomenon that will be with us for some time to come into the future. One of the things that, uh, now this, this happens with all of our disasters, but I think it particularly happens with with uh, radiological disasters, um, which is uh, one of the themes we'll see here is the, the huge power of perception, right? And the, and the perception of risk, how people perceive what is dangerous, what is not dangerous, et cetera. And so to, to contrast this, we could talk about, you know, most of our processes that are influencing us, the buildup to a wildfire, the tectonic pressure that's building up for an earthquake and all these, all these various things. You know, the day in, day out of the, the pre-disaster is a slow process, right? It's a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit, a little bit there. And so very gradual um, in many senses. Um, the actual, uh, we, of course, we do have fast things. We do have dramatic things that happen. Um, the spark that starts the wildfire, the, the, final, the final slipping of the fault uh, to, to enact the earthquake. And so obviously we have some fast things as well as we have this ongoing slow thing. Um, but it's, it's interesting how, how consequential some of these very dramatic rapid things can be. Um, particularly these days, we can document those dramatic events. And it's just an aspect of human nature that, that when we see these things that are 
that are very visual or very um, uh, visceral that they seem to imprint upon us more. And sometimes we, we tend to think they are um, more dangerous or more impactful than maybe in fact they truly are. And so again, that, that's a phenomenon of, that's always gone on in human society, but in the modern world with so many cameras, so, such everything being recorded all the time, it makes, uh, it, it makes us more able to follow these types of events. When these uh, rare events that do happen, the dramatic lightning hitting the tree and that kind of stuff, when they do happen, they, they offer the possibility of changing our perspectives, right? So, um, so let me ask you guys, uh, here are a few things. Uh, upper left, Sputnik, uh, the Russian Ru Russians successfully launching the first artificial satellite that orbited the earth. Um, I think five times a day. I can't remember how many times it went, went around the earth. Um, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was uh, so far the closest we've ever come to actual nuclear confrontation. Um, the pan the, uh, the our current coronavirus pandemic on the in the top middle, 9/11 in the bottom center. Uh, the Challenger, the space shuttle disaster when that blew up. Um, uh, I was watching that live in high school live stream where everybody was, uh, we had a television in the corner of the, of the classroom where we I watched it and then, then that happened and people were like, wait, what? Is that like a, like a special effect? Well, that doesn't look real. Uh, and then obviously the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico <clears throat> um, a bit over a decade ago. Um, so those are really dramatic things. Let me ask you guys, what, what, uh, what do you guys remember? What, what sort of unfolding, events do you like, oh my gosh, I remember where I was when that thing happened. I, you know, I, uh, oh, I, was, I was at school, I was at home. Anything you guys, well, what are your touch points so far? Uh -huh. Sure, two weeks of coronavirus and then we'll be back, right? Well, I meant to say with two years. <laughs> Right. So, like, of course, I'm in the second little nowhere. But I just remember sitting in like this really busy little cafe with Trump on the TV, um, and thinking like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. And like, yeah, that was that was the only weird thing. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, so good. So, so two examples of the onset of the pandemic. Anybody else? So, I presume the pandemic. Everybody has some memory of that one. Yeah. I remember uh, when 9/11 happened. I was like watching them on the news with my mom. I was like five at the time, and I like made a comment saying like, "Oh, are the are the Power Rangers gonna come uh, <laughs> come save the day?" Right, 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 right. But yeah, that was uh, you know I was pretty young, but you know I was a pretty burnt in memory. Yeah, uh, when 9/11 happened, I had just gone up to Stanford to start my postdoc, and. Um, and, and uh, my wife had just come up to, to join me. She was also just starting at Stanford. And uh, I had a project. Uh, um, uh, my, my main task in the early years of my being at Stanford was to manage this uh, uh, grassland, this grassland and oak woodland. And, uh, and so we were doing monitoring. And so we were getting up er supposedly early. I wouldn't consider it super early, but we were like getting to school around like 7.30 and starting off and, and, and such. And uh, and my wife woke me up and said, there's something going on. I'm like, what? I was like, half sleeping. There's something going on. And we turned the radio, and she had the radio on. And then it just got crazier and crazier. I was like, wow, I listened to the radio for about an hour. I'm like, this is crazy. And I started putting on my, my clothes. My wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I got to go to school. I got like surveys to do. I got people to talk to. You, you, you can't do that. Like that's, we can't do that. Like, what are you talking about? It's fine. And uh, anyway, she, she pulled the, uh, the spouse card and said, yeah, nope, you can't go to school today. And so um, uh, I was like, oh man. And then as the day unfolded, it got crazier and crazier and the towers fell and, and the Pentagon and everything. It was just, it was very surreal, super surreal. It didn't, didn't seem like it was actually, uh, uh, it, it, it just didn't seem real. It didn't seem real for a while. 
Other ones, what are the other things you guys remember or other events that were just, wow. Looking back, you, 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 have, a, you have a visceral memory of where you were when you heard it or when you saw it. I'm older than you guys, so I remember many things. <laughs> so I mentioned the Challenger there, uh, Deepwater Horizon. Uh, we were here at school. Um, actually, Deepwater Horizon, I, was, I had just gone back to Louisiana and was talking with all of the, uh, uh, there's basically a, a thing called the Bro Act, which sounds like a uh, bra, but it's spelled uh, B-R-E-A-U. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a um, sort of French derived name of a congressman that passed this law. And we had the 25th anniversary of it. And uh, so uh, my colleague and I were invited. We went to this thing. It was a bunch of speeches. And all these people came from Washington, D.C. And we thought, oh, my God, it's going to be like two days of events and everything. And everybody came. And all the people from Washington, the famous people, gave a bunch of speeches. And then after about like 1 o'clock, they all left. <laughs> so so my, my friend who was hosting it at his, uh, at his um, um, uh, B and B kind of thing, uh, and my friend and I were basically the only one left. They're like, "What?" It's like all these people came, like 150, 200 people, and they all left. We're like, "That's weird." So we ended up hanging out, drinking the rest of the day. And two days later is when the Deepwater Horizon happened. Um, and and that 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 meeting was about mm, 50 miles from where the Deepwater Horizon uh, event happened. Um, so anyway, yeah. So I remember all those uh, things are very very impactful. I would say that um, some of these things, like, like uh, the, the two on the right, the Challenger, the Deepwater Horizon, massive events, um, nation in shock, all that stuff. Uh, and this is a controversial thing, but I, I would say not a massive amount changed in the wake of those two things. Uh, the folks that run the space shuttle program would say that's not true. Um, but really, it became more of an, an inside baseball things that were changed. Um, and, and things always change whenever we have these disasters, but uh, not as much changed as maybe you would have thought would have changed. Uh, then we have uh, uh, pandemic in the middle and 9-11, a lot changed in that context, not just in the sector or the, or the, um, the agency or the, the, the part people directly influenced, but it you know, changed just about everything around the globe. Uh, and then on the left would be um, an example where things changed, um, but things particularly policy-wise changed. Um, in the case of Sputnik, we had a massive influ infusion of funding into, amongst other things, universities, STEM education in high schools and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and we've essentially left that period now. We, we, we're not as interested in, in um, funding uh, young folks learning these days. Uh, and, and the same with um, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis really changed our policy stance and, and how we thought about um, the Cold War. Um, so yeah, so, so we, can have, we can have a range of these types of perspectives. Uh, in general, I would say, um, we have something that's very in our face, like a wildfire, um, like a volcano. Those things can be scary, but we seem to be able to wrap our heads around those things, right? Something we can touch, something we can see, something we can experience, shoot on a, a movie camera. What tends to be much scarier, right? And, and now you guys, people like horror movies here? People like scary movies here? Yes, all oh, you kids, you love your scary movies. Uh, Right, so what's scary? Is it scarier when there's, well, yeah, I'll just say, I don't think it's as scary when an alien comes after you, right? I think it's more scary when there's somebody walking down the hall and you hear the kind of music, and like, he just, hey, nothing happens, and hey, nothing happens. That to me is more tense because it just is like, I, I don't know what's going on. I feel, I feel, um, less in control, right? When I see the monster or the aliens, like, okay, there's an alien. And so I'd say that, would you guys agree with that? Or you say, no, yeah, 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 generally? Okay, yeah, cool. So I think that's the experience of most folks. And so many of our disasters we've talked about so far are things that are fairly tangible, stuff that's fairly easy to get our, our heads around, right? But when it comes to radiation, 
it's a little bit different, right? We can't necessarily see it. We can't necessarily um, taste it um, or, or, or watch it move through the, propagate through the environment kind of thing. So there's also a lot of misinformation. Most people don't understand, um, or if they did at one point, they've forgotten what it, what it means. So, it, so it's, we can't see it to begin with. And sometimes the concepts are a little bit vague and a little bit scary. So all that makes this sort of a menacing, and other things too, make this a menacing type of disaster, I think. Recall that there's a couple different flavors. We can talk about these nuclear reactions. There's fission, there's fusion. Fission is in the nuclear, well, it could be both, but, but, but fission are, is the classic World War II nuclear bombs. Um, fission is what's powering our nuclear power plants. Fusion is what we'd like to be using. Fusion in terms of power plants. Fusion is the thing where we can scoop out a bucket of seawater and just a couple of the deuterium atoms in there would be enough to you know, run power the city for you know, weeks or months kind of thing. So fusion is the holy grail of energy. We've been working on this for a century and still haven't quite figured it out. Um, and every time we talk to the theoretical physicists, they always say we're about 20 years away. We're, about, we're getting closer, we're about 20 years away. So we have an ignition facility in Lawrence Livermore Labs up in, up in Northern California. Um, there's a big, huge facility in Europe being built. Um, so the hope is that these things will, will someday be with us and, and afford us cheap carbon neutral uh, energy, but for now, not. But, but again, there's these couple different flavors. The main concern when it comes to radiological events is is this idea of ionizing radiation. And again, you guys, if this is, this is too slow or too basic, you guys interrupt me if this is all just remembering your stuff from intro chemistry. But, um, but ionizing radiation is either a particle or an electromagnetic wave that, that are energetic enough to mess with other um, molecules and other atoms specifically to, to strip off uh, electrons. And so that's what we, we mean by an ion or an ionizing act. What this ionizing radiation does uh, biologically um, or, uh, can be broken down in a couple of different things. Burns, metabolic, messing with, and then ultimately messing with your genetic blueprints. Generally speaking, that goes in order of, of timing of effect. So if it's strong enough, you'll first feel a burn. Then if you get a high enough dose, then you're going to start feeling sick and your, your regulatory mechanisms and you know, your metabolism will start getting thrown off. And then if you survive long enough, your, your DNA can be whacked, right? So you start having other deeper uh, problems, cancers and things like that. Um, where this ionizing radiation comes from, uh, two, two broad categories we can talk about. Uh, the naturally occurring ionizing radiation sources and the stuff that we uh, either create or make more abundant through our actions in the environment. So classic background stuff is, is radiation come from the sun, coming from cosmic radiation, pounding the earth. We also have just the natural processes that form the earth uh, we have um, we have breakdown products and things of that nature, so we can we can have exposures. A classic one would be radon gas, uh, which is most common in areas where we tend to have a, a lot of granites and things of that nature. Um, so in places like Colorado or in the Sierras, um, uh, we tend to have a lot of uh, of uh, radon gas again naturally occurring, and then we have the stuff that we mess with. And we, through our, through our own actions, have caused to increase in concentration. So this would be things like going to the doctor to get it, or going to the dentist to get an annual uh, x-ray of your, of your teeth, see if you have cavities. <clears throat> or maybe you're not feeling well, your stomach feels really bad, so they're gonna do some CAT scan of you or some other kind of medical scan. Uh, power plants uh, emit this stuff. 
uh, it turns out that for a quote unquote normally operating coal power plant and a normally operating uh, nuclear power plant, you get much more exposure from the coal plant than you will from the uh, nuclear power plant because uh, most of our coal has some other stuff mixed in with it. Uh, and then of course, when we've, when we've done uh, weapons testing and things of that nature um, in terms of the making of war. Uh, so as far as ionizing radiation, this is what we're talking about here. So recall, uh, this stuff is low frequency energy. As we get high, as we go to the right here in my figure, the amount of energy is getting higher and higher and higher. Uh, the frequency of those and the wavelength is, is shrinking and, and the intensity is growing in terms of the energy uh, combined. And so this stuff down here is non-ionizing radiation. So radio waves, that type of stuff, uh, heat, that type of stuff. And then when we start getting up around here and then we, we cross this threshold right around in the, in the realm of ultraviolet, depends on what, what isotope, depends on what tissue we're talking about, but, um, but, but ultraviolet can be ionizing radiation. Then we get x-rays, gamma rays, et cetera. And the more we go to the right, the more potentially damaging the, the radiation is to biological tissues. Um, where does, and so, and so, you know, what are the things that come off? We, there's uh, actually four products, but the, the three most common ones would be alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. We start with some parent molecule, and then we have decay, either because it's naturally unstable or because maybe we bombarded it with another um, proton or, or whatever. And then that will induce this element to change into something else and emit something, right? And so that emit something is either a helium atom, just an electron, or uh, electromagnetic energy in the form of gamma rays. You can also get uh, neutrons coming off, but I've left that off here. Oh. And so, uh, depending on what type of ionizing radiation we're talking about, alpha, beta, or gamma, um, we can block that with different materials. So alpha radiation, we can block with just simply holding up my jacket or a piece of paper, pretty much anything will stop that stuff. Uh, beta radiation will go through that paper, but it won't go through me. It'll get lodged essentially in me. Um, and then gamma rays are much more energetic and powerful and they will go through that paper and through my whole body and uh, keep on going until we hit something very, very dense, something like a, a leaded object. Um, and then this gets to this idea of half-life. So this idea of something is in one stage and then it's, it's breaking down, turning into something else. We call that radioactive decay. And the rate at which that, that, that um, changes, we refer to as the half-life. And again, the half-life is the period over which we start off with whatever, 10 pounds of this stuff. The half-life is when we would only have five pounds of that material left. And you can see, depends on the, the particular element, they can be over the scale of hours to days, they can be weeks to months, years to decades, or thousands of years, or even millions or billions of years, um, and all of these are all of these are potentially in play in um, in most of our discussions. Uh, carbon fourteen is just it isn't really problematic, but that's we use carbon fourteen for research purposes dating, but that's not really an issue for um, our nuclear accidents. And the same thing with radium. Not, not always, not, not a super, super popular, uh, super abundant one. Okay, so isotopes. So, so remember, that's what we're looking at right here. These are different isotopes of plutonium, uranium, et cetera. And remember, an isotope is something like an element's family. So we're all in the same family. And we're all related, meaning we have the same number of protons. But my uncle's a little weird, kind of sits over there on the table. And my aunt sitting over there. And so we're all in the same family, but we're not exactly identical, right? 
So we're all related that we have the same proton number, but we differ in the number of neutrons. That's, that's what's making up those different, um, those different isotopic numbers and designations. These elements are either stable or unstable. The unstable ones are the things we call radioactive. And those are the things that we're worried about in terms of these radiological releases. Um, all of the, so when we first started getting into this over a century ago, we, we used the periodic table. We started figuring out what we, what we knew. And then we could start to predict where there might be other elements, right? Um, and so we actually uh, started synthesizing some of these uh, things in, in the lab. Everything that we've made, every artificial element that we've made, or artificial, every, yeah, I'll just say every, every element that we've synthesized um, is uh, radioactive. So those, those, all those artificial isotopes are radioactive and they will decay. And a lot of them decay very quickly. Uh, generally speaking, um, yeah, 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 okay, I'll say that. Uh, so generally speaking, hydrogen is the only thing we've given special names to. Everything else we say U238, we, we say the element's name and the, the, its number, but that's it. But with hydrogen, we have special terms. So regular hydrogen is one proton, uh, one electron circling around a proton. Uh, when we have uh, a neutron in there with that proton, we call that deuterium. And when we have two neutrons in there, we call that tritium. And these are important in things like I mentioned, fusion and, and other things. Um, yeah, this is all just review of uh, new chemistry, but this is where we get those, this is how we get those designators. Okay, almost done here with background. The last thing to talk about is how we, um, how we measure this stuff. So this is, you, you might not have had this so that's stuff hopefully you all had before in your intro chemistry class. We don't necessarily go into this, these other parts, but we'll just go over them. Uh, important thing to note is we've used different terms for measuring radiation over the last 120 years or so. And so some terms have come in, some terms have come out. These are the um, international scientific unit terms. So these are the, the quote unquote approved terms or the the quote unquote correct terms for now. Uh, Becquerel is the top one, Gray is the middle one, and Sievert is the uh, third one there. Um, so here we go. Here we have our element right here, and uh, the radioactive element, and it decays. To measure that decay, we can measure that in Becquerels. Um, once that that uh, and so so that that's how much stuff is coming off. Um, then we have this issue of we want to measure it primarily. We want to measure it in biological tissue. Initially, we mostly focused on human tissue, and so that so we're interested in that. And so these two, these next two, are related to measuring it um, and and trying to estimate potential damage. So a gray is a measure of dose and it's joules per kilogram. The sievert is uh, the same thing, but it's also, it, it's that same main part, joules per kilogram, um, added to another factor, which has to do with a particular isotope and how, and, and how much um, energy is coming off it and sort of an adjustment, adjustment tool. Um, right. So there we go. Okay, so that, that, that was all stuff that you might have heard in your chemistry class. So then the new stuff you probably haven't heard. Um, with our other disasters, um, we uh, either have discussed or we will discuss these different units to measure them. With um, hurricanes, we have these hurricane strengths. With um, earthquakes, we have measures of magnitude and intensity. And so the same, so we, we, we needed something to describe nuclear accidents, okay? And so what was first proposed in the 1990 is the main thing that people cite. We'll talk about some issues with it in a second, but this is, uh, so this is what we've used since 1990. And most 
uh, significant accidents, we have hindcasts. We've gone back in time and sort of assigned them a rating on this scale. So this is a subjective scale. This is the International Nuclear Event Scale proposed by the, I didn't, I should have put this, I should have spelled it out. International Atomic Energy Agency. This is a UN affiliated entity. So this is the entity when we want uh, to want Iran to not develop nuclear weapons. And we want a third party to go check to see if they're, you know, having plutonium in the reactors or whatever. The, the IAEA is, is usually the entity that's involved with that kind of stuff. Um, oh, introduced in 1990, not 10, 1990. Nice, good job, John. Um, so it's a, it's a scale from one to seven, there's actually a zero. And a zero is when something happens, but nothing, nothing really uh, manifested it went wrong. But if we, if like a valve was turned, like, oh my God, we shouldn't turn the valve, but we, we fixed it before a problem happened. There's also a zero level, but, um, but we'll just talk about one through seven here today. These things are called incidents, one through three, four, five, six, seven are accidents. Um, the idea was supposed to be, as with many of our massive natural disaster impacting events, um, we oftentimes use a logarithmic scale because there can be so much energy release, so much destruction that it's hard to put on a linear scale. So this is intended to be logarithmic. The problem with it is that it's extremely subjective. So it's basically a bunch of folks sitting around in a conference room drinking coffee for a couple of weeks, reading a bunch of papers debating and then and then uh, coming to a conclusion. So it has value, right? And we're trying to convey to people, is this like a crazy big problem or a medium big problem, right? So there's, not, there's absolutely value in having this, but it's, uh, it, it's, it differs from almost, I'd say it differs from all of our other measurements of natural disasters in that it is so subjective. Um, and, uh, a key problem, which was actively debated after the Fukushima uh, event, um, it conflates magnitude and intensity. Okay, so I'll just talk about the accidents here. So these are just accidents. So the four, five, six, seven scores on the international nuclear event scale. Um, there have only ever been two category seven events. So far, thank God. Um, there's only one six, although some of these, there's sort of a question, is it a five or six? But there's only one official six event. And then once we start getting to five and four, there, there, are, there are multiple ones. I'm just showing you some examples here. Um, and it, as obviously, as you'd imagine, as the, as the intensity scale declines, we see more and more of these uh, there's the, the more examples of these different um, events. Okay, so let's start with, you guys want to start with big and go low or start low and go high? What do you guys want to do? Let's start big. Start big, okay. Jack wants to start big. Ooh, now it's a debate, okay. <laughs> Who wants to go high to low, raise your hand. Who wants to go low to high? Okay, everyone, okay, so low to high wins. Okay, all right, so we'll, we'll start low. So we're gonna start at the bottom. We're going to start at the bottom. Jack is crushed. Okay, so, um, so yes, so here we go. Um, this is a, these are all accidents, but this first one is just highly localized consequences. So there's at least one death of a, of a person, um, but it doesn't have to be in the public, right? So it could be, say, a plant operator or somebody some official person working in, in an official capacity with that material or whatever. Um, and there has to be a significant release from the containment structure, but not escape to the environment. So maybe the reactor core stuff spread around the internal parts of the core inside the containment vessel, but it didn't get out into the environment, let's say. And so uh, examples of that are uh, the, our, our first, um, our first real reactor, SL1, this was in Idaho. Um, and this was, this was, this was uh, basically the army said, hey, this nuclear stuff sounds really cool. We want, we want some portable 
um, some portable nuclear power. By portable, they meant something like, you know, I don't know, the size of the lab building here, or not, not the lab building, the size of like our lab space here, plus maybe another lab space. So kind of a, a big thing, but not, not aircraft carrier size, right? So, so somewhat portable. Now this was, this was constructed in the 1950s and then was operated in sort of an experimental context. Folks were figuring out how to make it work and this and that. No, or um, I wouldn't say no, but very little training. Very little in the way of physical uh, structures for protection. So the, the um, automatic safety stuff, not really so much in existence. The people's training, not so much, not so great. Um, how we make nuclear re, uh, uh, power plant nuclear reactors is we have a bunch of the, the material, the radioactive material, right? The, we call it the fuel. And they're in some kind of matrix. And if we just let them go, choom, 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 you know, this is going to happen, right? This little two, 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 this dude's going to bump into this dude. No, he's going to activate him. And then he's going to burn, 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 and it's going to start, start this chain reaction, right? And so it's going to start to, to heat up more, 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 more. And as we talked about in my, my intro lecture, um, uh, essentially what we do with nuclear power plants is we boil water. It's incredible technology and we just make tea, essentially. Right. And so, and so, uh, uh, very old school, right? The only things that differ from that are uh, hydrothermal or, 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 or hydropower, um, solar power, um, and tidal energy or wind. So all the other stuff we use essentially is just boiling water or boiling a liquid. So uh, this, this stuff is embodied energy in these materials. So if we just let them be next to each other, it's going to start to move towards criticality. It's, it's going to start to move towards heating up hotter, 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 more and more, more energy released, right? So we want to control that. We want a little bit of energy at the level that we can efficiently use. And so we'll put structures in between right here. So we'll lower something in between these two molecules, elements, so that they don't, so that it's, it's they bump into each other less frequently. We call those control rods, right? So uh, in the case of this SL1 thing, this is out in Idaho, put up in Idaho, because we didn't know how, didn't know how to make this work. And this was sort of still, we're still learning. And in that case, we had the fuel, and then we had the rods that would go down into it, the control rods, had to be lowered manually. So you had to go walk onto the reactor and <clears throat> as we're getting closer to this event, um, uh, things start to go wrong. So, so it starts to get harder and harder to push these control rods in. So, you know, kind of, you know uh, uh, um, the folks that are operating them aren't necessarily the most sound uh, and the most well-trained. So, uh, there's three gentlemen that are that are um, uh, on duty at, at the station at the time when the accident happens, and um, one guy. Uh, and and so just I'd say these days we'd say there'd be a Title IX probably <laughs> filed against them, right? They're just they're, one guy's going to strip clubs and is having a hard time with his family and all this kind of weird stuff. One of the guy's wives calls him at about 7 p.m. and says, we're getting a divorce. And they have some conversation and then hang up. And so you can imagine someone is probably not in the best state of mind. Might have been having an affair with another guy who's one of the other three that's working with them. So you can imagine it might be a little tense, right? So um, we don't know exactly what happened. The, the investigation took two years because these two guys were, were or these three people were killed. Um, as in like, uh, so, so the, the, it was an uncontrolled 
run of the reactor and it exploded in milliseconds and essentially shredded these guys. One of the individuals somehow lived after, a, I won't go into all the details, but horrifying, horrifying accident. The fire guys, the, the emergency response people came in that knew these folks couldn't recognize the body, right? I mean, it was just crazy, melted into the ceiling and all kinds of stuff. Responders, first responders could only go inside to try to do something for 65 seconds at a time because the radiation tension was so crazy um, and on and on and on. So long story short, that was a total failure because of the control, the physical, the, the, the design of the reactor and the, the uh, lack of default safety mechanisms and the lack of really robust training for our um, operators of these plants. Yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the things that also seems to have played a role was so we have what's called radiation de induced deformity of metals. So, so metals just get so much radiation, they essentially kind of start to break down and they can swell. And so that was one of the reasons the, the control rods were, were harder to, you know, fit in the perfect slot as they were a little bit, you know, chunkier than they were and, and all those issues. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's something like when you guys when you guys blink, I think I think the explosion happened um, about uh, one twentieth faster than you can blink your eyes, or something, something like that. Something like that. I mean, it was it was just instantaneous. Okay, so that's that, that's an example. Uh, so so those guys died, but primarily it was right on the site and and didn't uh, uh, didn't. Cause a huge problem. Okay, number next. Let's go to let's go to an example of number five. We'll talk about Three Mile Island in a bit, but but this is now uh, an accident. But it's we're starting to have wider consequences. Okay, so it's not just the facility or not just the immediate immediate vicinity. Um, there's multiple deaths associated with this, and we need to have clear countermeasures going on into the future, right? So we have to enact the stuff. Our emergency plans have to be enacted and we respond to that. Um, I'll hold off on talking about uh, examples for a little bit. Um, number six would be a serious accident. So this is not only those previous levels, but also a significant radiological release into the environment. Um, and so uh, this, uh, uh, Kishtim was in the Soviet Union. We didn't really learn about it until a couple decades later uh, with a, a Soviet defector. Um, so this is basically rural, rural Soviet Union, uh, a weapons plant, and stuff went wrong. We're not entirely sure what exactly happened, but, but stuff went wrong and essentially contaminated a huge area, uh, hundreds of uh, uh, thousands of square kilometers, and several. It was it was in a rural area, so um, several, a couple of villages were impacted immediately. One was evacuated fairly quickly within a few days or so. Other another one took about two years to evacuate because again it's the Soviets, right? They don't want to say anything's going wrong. They want to they want to they want to completely control the information, um, and uh, contaminated a huge area. Uh, in this part of the Soviet Union with very radioactive stuff, including the river, et cetera. Uh, several, uh, I, don't, I can't remember off the top of my head, several dozens of folks um, are estimated to have died uh, because of uh, radiation, uh, sort of longer term uh, um, uh, cancers and such. Uh, the exact number of how many Soviet folks died, you know, workers, that's, that's, I don't think that's clear. Um, and then we can talk about a level seven. A level seven on this scale is the largest possible thing. There is nothing bigger than seven. And so this is a very major release with a lot of radiation getting out into the environment, lots of 
uh, potential human health effects, lots of potential human or lots of potential environmental effects, and need for extremely extensive countermeasures, probably in the billions of dollars or tens or hundreds of billions of dollars, even possibly in terms of what we need to do to respond to it. Again, there's only been two of those Chernobyl and Fukushima. It seems like very different. What? Um, yeah, so we'll talk, we'll talk about those. We'll talk about those next. Um, uh, yes, yes. Before we go on to talk about those, though, I want to mention an alternative measure of intensity of nuclear accidents. And so that's the nuclear. So this one, this one was the International Nuclear Event Scale. This is from the officials at the IAEA. This is a, from a retired British professor who now lives in France. Um, and so this is the so-called nuclear accident magnitude scale. So this was proposed after, the, after Fukushima because uh, of the realization that the, the way we're describing stuff maybe isn't as helpful as it otherwise would be. So this also is uh, logarithmic, right? In terms of the, the, the amount of energy and, and, and quantities. Um, this only looks at atmospheric releases. This doesn't count if we spill radiation into the ocean, let's say. And uh, it's, it, it's similar. So it, it's, it's constructed this way, log y times 20, so that it comes out somewhat similar to, to this. So we, we, we sort of roughly align with this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven scale. And uh, uh, multiplied by R, where R is an equivalence of radioactive iodine, iodine 131, uh, and, and how much, how much we, we measured um, in terabecquels. Uh, uh, so what does it mean? Well, here are, here are four of those famous uh, events. Here is the old school one, like our official, official one that we, we default to, right? And so um, M just said, oh, Chernobyl and Fukushima, they're really different, right? So on the IAEA scale, they're, they're equivalent, right? Whereas when we use this more sophisticated uh, term, Chernobyl comes out as the most intense. Uh, nuclear accident or, or, or the most problematic nuclear accident that we've had so far, followed by Three Mile Island, worse than Fukushima, and then that, that uh, late 50s release in the Soviet wilderness um, event. Uh, so this is a more useful scale. It also separates out, tries to separate out intensity and magnitude. Uh, the problem is this only talks about atmospheric releases, and you have to have some measure of the, the radionuclides in the atmosphere. And so when we try to hind cast stuff, we can't, we can't really do it, right? Because we, maybe, we, maybe there weren't people out there measuring or we didn't go and, and, and get the data in the right way. So, so we, we, we can't do all the historic stuff. Probably here forward, we can but the hind casting doesn't really work. So, so far this, while, while, while this old approach has problems to be sure, it's the one that we have the more complete records uh, of for things. Cool. Questions about that so far? We have two systems to measure uh, nuclear radiological releases. Awesome. Um, so just to give you a sense for, for what we mean by ionizing radiation, so we can talk about just the total amount of radiation we get. We could also talk about the rate. And so just to give you a sense of what we're talking about, I just had two bananas on my drive into school. And so I got something like, um, you know, a little bit less than 200 nanosieverts of radiation from those bananas that just have naturally occurring uh, radiation in there uh, in the form of potassium and some other things. Uh, when, we, when you go through the airport uh, uh, and get scanned, you're getting about 250 nanosieverts of 
radiation um, through one of those uh, security stations. Um, if, when you go to see the dentist this year and he, and he or she takes your, your x-rays, you're getting somewhere between five to 10 micro sieverts of ionizing radiation. Uh, the evacuee, now this is not the, not the dude inside the plant fighting the fire, but of the regular residents around the Fukushima plant in Japan when the disaster happened, the folks that were the closest, the, the regular old residents, the regular citizens that were closest to the power plant, um, they got a maximum, it's estimated, of 68 um, millisieverts of exposure. If you smoke a pack and a half a day of cigarettes uh, for a year, there's a lot of nasty stuff in those, in that, uh, those cigarettes. Um, mostly what's going to cause you health effects are all the, the tox is all the toxicity, the poisons and all that stuff you're inhaling. But there's also some radiation in there. You would be getting something like 160 uh, millisieverts. So you'd be getting twice what that citizen got um, uh, near Fukushima. Uh, and then the Fukushima worker who was inside fighting the fire, trying to you know, do stuff close to the plant, the highest dose of a worker there is 670. Uh, that uh, proved, uh, uh, at least in some cases, lethal. Uh, and then uh, four to five, just no milla, micro, nano, just regular sieverts, four to five, um, you have a 50% probability of dying in a month. Uh, and that, and this, this is what we mean, lethal, this is, 50% uh, of the people will be dead within 30 days. That's how you read that. So, okay, so just, just you know, we're not gonna focus on this. It's not gonna have test questions or anything like that, on it, but just to give you a sense, right? So, so a lot of the stuff we're encountering is a very small, you know, a fraction of the Siebert in terms of regular uh, stuff that we do going in, uh, you know, living daily lives, sitting in front of your computer screen, doing work, et cetera. Is that, that cool? Questions about that? Okay, why don't we um, why don't we take a break? We'll take a, a ten minute break. Come back and we'll pick up what's going on with in uh, Ukraine right now.